Coming up on Market to Market. Alaskan glaciers recede in the wake of rising worldwide temperatures. The president calls for swift action in the battle against global climate change. And U.S. broiler producers prepare for a possible outbreak of avian influenza. Those stories and market analysis with Elaine Cub next. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com. And by Sookup Manufacturing Company. Offering a full line of grain drying and storage equipment and steel buildings, Sookup Manufacturing is on a mission to protect and preserve your crop and the tools that produce it. This is the Friday, September 4 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Mike Pearson. The turbulent ride on Wall Street took a brief holiday midweek. But lower job numbers and declining foreign markets pulled the rug out just before the start of the holiday weekend. According to the Labor Department, U.S. unemployment fell to 5.1 percent last month, a seven-year low. However, only 173,000 new jobs were created in August, well below what analysts believe is enough to keep the economic engine running. Early in the week, oil surged to its largest three-day gain since 1990 but fell back and finished the week just barely in positive territory. While the economy has exhibited signs of recovery, Creighton University's Mid-America Business Conditions Index slumped to just below growth neutral at 49.6. The move indicates weak and potentially negative growth for the final quarter of 2015. And volatility on Wall Street moderated when the Chinese stock market closed for a holiday weekend commemorating World War II. But that poor jobs showing sent the three popular indices sharply lower. As the market languishes in negative territory, recovery can be seen in the U.S. poultry population ravaged by last spring's avian influenza outbreak. And as producer Colleen Bradford Kranz found out earlier this week, southern states have begun to prepare for a possible outbreak of the disease. Paul Yeager explains. Some of the nation's most productive poultry states are preparing for the possibility that migrating ducks and geese will carry southward the avian influenza virus that has already devastated many Midwest flocks. We're trying to do everything we can to make certain that we keep avian influenza out of Arkansas, Oklahoma, and Missouri. The Poultry Federation, a chicken and turkey producer trade agency, brought together more than 500 industry representatives this week in Rogers, Arkansas. Conference attendees discussed ways to combat highly pathogenic avian influenza. The aggressive strain of bird flu, often fatal to chickens and turkeys, has already affected more than 48 million birds in the U.S. since the first case was detected in December of 2014. Iowa, Minnesota, and Nebraska have been hardest hit. Although no new cases have been identified since mid-June, states to the south particularly along the Mississippi River-centered migratory path, are concerned because waterfowl are known carriers. Pieces of that migration have started already. Um, we've seen Canadian geese, a, a large number of them, uh, in the southern part of Arkansas. We're hopeful that there, that there aren't any more cases, but we're preparing for the worst. Avian influenza caused estimated economic losses of $1.2 billion in Iowa alone this year, according to a new Iowa Farm Bureau Federation study. 15% of the state's turkeys were wiped out and 52% of laying birds. While Iowa is the nation's top egg producing state, Arkansas lands in the top five for both turkey and broiler production. USDA officials calculate broiler, turkey, and egg production accounted for $4.7 billion in sales for the state in 2014. When you look at those numbers and you look at the potential for uh, avian influenza to, to destroy 10 percent, 15, 52, if we were affected like Iowa was in the, in the 
layer industry, if our broiler industry took that hit, it would be, you know, multi-million dollar uh, hit to the state's economy. The virus does not survive in higher temperatures, and Arkansas's warmer climate may have helped the state with just one farm being affected this spring. But cooler fall weather may be another factor that works against a continuing lull. Tyson Foods, the world's second largest processor and marketer of chicken, beef and pork, is well aware of the danger associated with an outbreak of avian influenza. More than 4,000 farmers raised chicken for the Springdale, Arkansas-based conglomerate. The company released a statement saying, We're hopeful highly pathogenic avian influenza, HPAI, will not return to the U.S. when wild waterfowl begin their annual migration. However, Tyson Foods has been preparing for this possibility since the spring. And those whose livelihood depends on having healthy birds are doing what they can to maintain secure barns. OK Foods Incorporated, a poultry company that operates primarily in Arkansas and Oklahoma, doesn't have the geographic reach that companies like Tyson possess. However, one OK Foods employee left this week's poultry conference determined to stay on top of biosecurity at the company facilities he monitors. If it hits in our area, you know, in the middle of our area, I don't know that we are big enough to take that kind of hit. Um, but if it hits, I can guarantee you that we are going to try. Jim Griffin, a farmer in Benton County, one of the state's poultry powerhouses, raises young birds that will become laying hens. His northwest Arkansas farm has long had biosecurity measures in place, but the changing seasons have increased his vigilance. We're a shower in, shower out facility, um, boot change, clothes change. Uh, we're very biosecure. Still, Griffin knows it wouldn't take much for the virus to spread. If his farm were to become infected, the company for which he grows 80,000 birds annually would take the first financial hit. But Griffin's buildings would likely sit empty for a year. Well, my whole family is dependent on the poultry industry right now. If avian influenza were to hit northwest Arkansas, it would affect the whole region. I mean, it would shut down this area. Knowing that they can be carriers of the virus, most Arkansas poultry shows have banned ducks and geese. However, chickens were still allowed to compete for honors this week at the Fayetteville Base Washington County Fair, which describes itself as Arkansas's largest gathering of its kind. If the virus should spread, however, the state's fall poultry shows would likely be canceled, as has been done elsewhere in the country. While the virus doesn't present a risk to human health, some worry that the public isn't taking the economic threat seriously enough. Consumers may pay more attention if the cost of chicken rises in the way egg prices climbed earlier this year. It's crazy to think that one little thing can affect the whole economy, the whole market. But the repercussions wouldn't end at the grocery store or with farmers and poultry companies. The upstream and downstream people that are affected, whether that's the feed mill, people selling feed, veterinarians, transportation, uh, corn, you know, the, what, what would that do to the price of corn? Although the U.S. Department of Agriculture has been working on an avian influenza vaccine that it hopes to stockpile, it has yet to be used in U.S. flocks because it could put future poultry exports at risk. The U.S. policy is that we would not accept any poultry product from any foreign country where they are vaccinating. It would be very difficult for us to say, oh, but now we're going to vaccinate and you should accept poultry that's been vaccinated. So the effect on international trade um, will be uh, significant in the event we, we ever uh, elect to vaccinate. For now, southern poultry producers are left to wait, watch, and prepare for what may come this fall. We would hope that we would avoid it totally, but uh, odds are there'll be some more breaks this fall. 
but uh, I don't think they'll be on any on our farms because of our biosecurity. For Market to Market, I'm Paul Yeager. The Obama administration has stated that global climate change is a phenomenon that must be brought under control. Government data reveals levels of the greenhouse gas carbon dioxide have risen faster in the last 65 years than in the previous 400,000. Attempts have been made to address the issue with treaties. Nearly every nation in the world has agreed upon one accord or another, but in the U.S., legal support has been lacking. Next month, U.S. negotiators will travel to France to take another run at creating a legally binding universal agreement on climate change. This week, President Obama traveled to Alaska to drum up support for the upcoming French conclave. This is not simply a danger to be avoided. This is an opportunity to be seized. But we have to keep going. We're making a difference, but we have to keep going. We are not moving fast enough. If we were to abandon our course of action, if we stop trying to build a clean energy economy and reduce carbon pollution, if we do nothing to keep glaciers from melting faster and oceans from rising faster and forests from burning faster and storms from growing stronger, we will condemn our children to a planet beyond their capacity to repair. The Commander-in-Chief kicked off a three-day tour in Alaska early this week by addressing a State Department-sponsored summit on climate change in Anchorage. The President claimed man-made environmental problems threaten Alaskan homes and livelihoods and will force some villages to relocate sooner rather than later. We're here to say thank you to the President for elevating the issue. It's good, it's a good start, but it's not enough. We need more. And we need it on par with the science and we need a just transition. The president's words were echoed at a nearby rally, but environmental activists drew a stark contrast with recent Obama administration approval of Arctic drilling by energy giant Royal Dutch Shell. Protesters called for a cancellation of the policy, claiming the green light comes at a time when climate change is already wreaking ecological havoc through coastal erosion and receding sea ice. And while the president toured the last frontier, showcasing melting glaciers and rising sea levels, Shell Oil officials said drilling off Alaska's northwest coast is going well. Though recognizing opposition to the project, the multinational oil and gas company claims it stands ready to work with anyone who can help production be safer and more efficient. Oil will be required for a long time. Let's take a really close look at developing our own resources control how it's done and get all the benefits that go along with it. There are some people and some organizations that are absolutely opposed to this and nothing's going to change their mind about that. So I, my expectation is that will persist. We saw quite a bit of very public opposition when we were in the Pacific Northwest, you know, as the rigs were staged to come to Alaska and so forth. So I just have to make the assumption that that will continue. Opponents of President Obama's climate change agenda say transitioning away from fossil fuels would damage portions of the rural economy. But the leader of the free world says the time for action has arrived. Any so-called leader who does not take this issue seriously or treats it like a joke is not fit to lead. On this issue, of all issues, there is such a thing as being too late. And that moment is almost upon us. Next, the Market to Market Report. A combination of fund buyers taking advantage of other opportunities, good crop conditions and lower prices in South America pushed the grain markets lower. For the week, December wheat lost 16 cents, while the nearby corn contract fell 12 cents. Soybean prices suffered from cheaper foreign product and good weather as the November soybean contract lost nearly 20 cents for the week. December meal prices followed right along, dropping almost $6 per ton. In the softs, December cotton had a moderate decline, losing only 38 cents per hundredweight. Over in the dairy parlor, September Class 3 milk futures remained even with last week's close. In the livestock sector, prices were mixed as the October cattle contract fell $3.50, October feeders lost $6.70, and the October lean hog contract rose just over $2.70. In the currency markets, the U.S. dollar index gained just over one-tenth of one percent. 
Oil prices surged on declining rig counts during the week, but finished only 83 cents higher. Comex Gold lost 12.60 per ounce, and the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index fell back nearly two points to settle at 364.75. Here now to lend us her insight on these and other trends is one of our regular market analysts, Elaine Cup. Elaine, welcome back. Happy to be here. And it was a bit of a downer week, uh, no pun intended, I suppose, for looking at these grain and oil seeds markets. Absolutely. You know, we see wheat down 16 cents on the week. Tell us your thoughts on what's continuing to drive us farther downward in this market. Wheat actually had a, a specific news item this week in, in, on top of the fact that it has just been on a lower trend and it has no particular support. There's not really a level there where you would guess that it would stop falling. It's probably just going to keep falling until something happens. But on Thursday in particular, it had a double digit loss because the Stats Canada released a grain stocks report. And you know, the Stats Canada fit situation is actually the one piece of global bullishness that the wheat market has had in that Canada has had a disappointing crop. But Thursday's report was interpreted bearishly by the market. It said that their stocks were down 32 percent from a year ago, but that was still more grain on hand than the market was expecting. Bearish interpretation, just one more thing to keep on pressing wheat prices lower. Now, the decline in the, in the Canadian stocks on hand, does that have any impact overall looking at longer term on the global supply situation? I mean, sort of, I mean, they're a large part of the global wheat market, yes, but when you're in a situation where the global stocks to use ratio is 30%, the U.S. stocks to use, stocks to use ratio is 39%, does it really matter, you know, to, to one degree or another if there's slightly more Canadian wheat on hand than, than they expected? So when should producers begin to expect a bottom to be put in or at least some sideways trade, technically, fundamentally, anything we can be looking out for for a ray of hope? Yeah, um, you know, there, there's not much that I can think of that would come in right now. And, and pretty much everybody, all of the analysts and all of the market is feeling pretty bearish about this market. And that's the time when just superstitious wise, you would, that, that's when a surprise might happen. And you get, might have a bounce. But I cannot see anything on the horizon to specifically point to that, that might happen. Okay. Now, we also saw corn down this week. We've heard a lot of talk about the Chinese economy and the spillover effect that has in the U.S. commodity markets. And we've got a question here from Mike in Omaha, Nebraska. And Mike is curious how strong fundamentally is the relationship between grains prices and the tanking Chinese economy and how much is just money flow, people bailing out? I think over the past couple of weeks, it's mostly money flow. But his question about is there a fundamental relationship between commodity prices here in the United States and Chinese commodity consumption and global commodity consumption, absolutely. Especially for feed grains, especially for livestock, th these items that are, are that are really becoming more and more demanded by the Asian consumer. However, what happened in August, we don't know that the Chinese economy really collapsed at all. We don't know that it was more than just some headlines that caught a really spooky market at a time when in August, when a lot of people are out on vacation and you had pretty low volumes in the equity trade to begin with. And I think you just had a, a huge overreaction uh, a chain, you know, a waterfall effect of everybody freaking out, let's say, and, and we've recovered somewhat in the past couple of weeks. The actual news on the ground from China is that the consumers aren't really changing their behavior, so they're still going to their fast food restaurants, they're still demanding their, their greater protein, still going to be demanding feed grains to feed those animals. So I think the, the underlying story of Asian consumption of the commodities that we produce here in the agriculture industry, that's probably still in you know, as strong as it ever was, and we just had a major overreaction in the market. Okay. Now that, that leads us talking about this corn market, down 12 cents, December corn, combines are rolling in the south, they're getting ready to roll a little farther north. How do producers handle this crop? Yeah, I, again, uh, this is a bearish situation when we're about 10 cents, we're less than 10 cents away from the low that we established on August 12th, the day of that most recent um, USDA report. So if you look at that as support, and I don't think there was anything magic about that number, why the market stopped there. So there will be nothing magic about the market not stopping there again and just keeping going lower. I think it would be a miracle to go through a harvest season without losing another 10 cents. I mean, just seasonally, we are going to have weakness if you have a reasonably sized ample harvest, which we probably are going to do. So I think the expectation that a farmer should have is that it's probably going to continue lower unless something happens. And unlike wheat, 
we can maybe brainstorm some things, some surprises that could happen to create a harvest rally in the weather situation. If, for instance, El Nino continued to have a very wet pattern across the Midwest, you could have late harvest, um, continued losses to the overall supply, continued losses to the acreage from flooding. Things could potentially happen. Now, none of this has happened yet, but it's something that could happen. At this point, we're still on a lower trend. Stick it in the bin and hope for recovery post-harvest. If you're going to stick it in the bin and wait for a seasonal upward trend, which is very reasonable in a, in a time frame of, of, you know, ample stocks, then you should be looking a long way down the road. I mean, okay. talking March or June, July. Okay. Now, soybean market, almost 20 cents off this week. New crop soybeans, Elaine, is there the possibility for a rally or at least a bottom here coming off this next uh, USDA report? I feel like it's the exact same situation as corn where we've got harvest, you've got a seasonal time frame when things are going to be working lower. There's nothing magic here that's going to stop it from going below 850 um, unless something strange happens. So again, you're in the exact same situation where it's, it's going to tend to continue to move lower until something changes. And all of these outside pressures, if there's continued news, if actual news from China or news about the U.S. dollar, those kinds of things are probably not going to be friendly to the grains in the near term. So there's a lot of reasons for both of these markets to keep going lower in the short term before they eventually, someday, hopefully, turn higher. Well, now that being said, we did see an exceptional, at least versus trade expectations, export uh, export number yeah. this week. A uh, million plus metric tons of yeah. soybeans ordered for November uh, November delivery, I believe. And yet the market did nothing. Right. And it was to China. Well, some of it was to China, some of it was to unknown. But it was very... Uh, and it was surprising, especially when you look at the situation in Brazil. Brazil has a very cheap currency right now, 26 cents on the dollar, which is cheaper than it's been in the past decade. And it's just keeping trending lower and lower and lower. So you would think that most of the export demand for globally for soybeans should be looking to South America first. But to have that great progress here in the United States, that absolutely should have been a bullish point of, of news for the grain markets. And, and perhaps that will be reflected in the upcoming USDA report. They might have to eventually bring up their export projection for soybeans. If we can get a couple weeks in a row of decent export numbers, maybe that'd be a supportive factor. Now let's jump down and talk uh, the livestock markets here. Uh, live cattle, 350 down, continuing to sell. Elaine, where do you put this market? Well, and I think the last time I was on Market to Market, I said 150 was the price. And I still kind of believe that that's the justified price around which this market will continue to consolidate. And we are just at a, at a, at a lower leg of that consolidation right now, which makes sense in September. This is the time frame when we're going to probably continue to see some weaker prices. Unfortunately, in the cash market, it's been a, even more concerning than on the futures market, where we've had two weeks in a row of 3 or $4 losses. So it's a little bit bigger or more volatile than I would expect, but I think that the structural, you know, the, the structure of this market, of the, the lower numbers, the heavier cattle, the, the decent export um, prospects for beef from this country, structurally, I still expect it to recover back eventually. Look back towards that 150, upper 140s. Yes. Now, on the feeder cattle side, we're hearing lots of heifers being retained. Any chance we could find a bottom or maybe a slight rally in this market here over the next month to six weeks? In that sort of time frame, perhaps. I believe that this market has overreacted probably alongside the rest of the commodities. It's been, it's been oversold on the futures side. Um, but longer term, I believe there's going to be a lot of pressure against these feeder calf prices. You look into the, to the spring contracts, they're looking 186 sort of, time, sort of prices because the feeder industry itself just does not want to be facing these losses. And they are facing incredible losses right now, projecting out into 2016. So I think they do not want to have to scramble like they did this last year. They're not anticipating that because, as you mentioned, the, the herd is expanding somewhat. So I believe that they're hoping to take this this $200 thing and put it behind us. Now, the cattle feeder, who's been looking at those losses this year, has been a tough year. Should he or she be buying deferred feeder cattle contracts on this potential overcorrection? Possibly, yeah. I th you know, I think that the expansion has not been huge, right? We're talking maybe a 3 or 4% expansion in the herd above the low. So it's probably not enough to change, again, like I said, the entire structure of supply. I believe they may still have to scramble for supplies if they really want to get to a full capacity in these feedlots. Okay, so maybe taking a little risk management and yeah. buying ahead for the spring. Yeah, that might be a good idea. Well, now let's talk the hog market. The, the really one, one ray of sunshine in the entire commodity complex was the pork market up 272, 
they're building barns like crazy. This market, the, the industry continues to grow. Elaine, how many more weeks can, can we rise in this hog? Well, it probably is justified for it to moderate out here, but the, the beauty of the hog market is there is really bullish things to say about export demand. We saw the July numbers um, and coming from China, and this is again another, I mean, it's backward looking. We don't know exactly what's happening now in China, but the, the thought is that that Asia will continue to demand this meat and uh, there's markets for it so there's there's places for it to go seasonally now and looking at the future structure for the hog futures themselves you'd be looking at probably some lower prices here through the end of the year but nothing nothing disastrous on this market at the moment in the port complex for the export game in, in selling to China and the other markets around the world other than the US who would be our biggest competitor do we have to worry about strength in the US dollar is my question well you know, our biggest competitor would be domestic production in China itself or, yeah, China China particularly, but domestic production in, in any of these countries that um, are trying to import U.S. pork. So the U.S. dollar in this does produce a headwind to, you know, the meat that we export. And that's something to really keep in mind here these next couple of weeks as the Federal Open Markets Committee gets together and we're thinking about the September rate hike potentially we could very well be seeing some volatility in the U.S. dollar, and that could have knock-on effects not only for pork, but for all of these markets. All right. Well, we will keep an eye on the Federal Open Market Committee, see what they do and how that affects the dollar. And all of the industry, yeah. Well, thanks for joining us this thanks, week, Mike. Elaine. That wraps up this edition of Market to Market. But Elaine and I will continue our discussion and answer some of your questions in the Market Plus segment available on our website. You'll also find audio podcasts of this discussion as well as streaming video of the program exclusively at that Market to Market website. You can also interact with us through Twitter and Facebook. And join us again when we'll explore how residents of one parched town are battling the drought just to stay in their homes. So until next time, thanks for watching. I'm Mike Pearson. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content. Funding for Market to Market is provided by... Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com. And by Sookup Manufacturing Company. Offering a full line of grain drying and storage equipment and steel buildings, Sookup Manufacturing is on a mission to protect and preserve your crop and the tools that produce it.